Father, we embark on this journey, and we thank you that you've made this provision for us, that this conference message was actually put into writing. So as we go through this conference message, we just say with Mordecai of old, for such a time as this. So we stand into your blessing, your covering, and your work in our lives to grant us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the full knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. I'm going to be reading from chapter 1 of Revelation as we begin the battle for life. I'll be reading from there, but I want to read an introductory comment that was made by Lance Lambert in Life and Ministry of Theodore Austin Sparks, and it was authored by the co-worker of Sparks. His name is Lance Lambert, whom we've known through the years, who's with the Lord now. He made this comment in that particular attribution to Mr. Sparks. He says, Now I, Lance Lambert, must also tell you something else about Brother Sparks. He looked marvelous, but actually he suffered very much from ill health. I think because he was outwardly a very reserved man and very quiet man, inwardly much happened. The result was he had a certain kind of condition that meant that the whole of his stomach lining was covered by ulcers. This meant he had a very great indigestion and much pain and he always looked a kind of yellow-green color. Some of the greatest conferences were actually given at his greatest point of pain and trouble. One of them, now a book in print, called The Battle for Life, he actually gave sitting in a chair. We'll begin reading from Revelation 1. I'll be reading from the Amplified 2015 version. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, that is, his unveiling of the divine mysteries, which God the Father gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place in their entirety. He sent and communicated it by his angel, divine messenger, to his bondservant John, who testified and gave supporting evidence to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus, even to everything that he saw. Blessed, happy, prosperous, and to be admired is he, the one reading, is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy, and who keep the things which are written in it, heeding them and taking them to heart for the time of fulfillment is near. John to the seven churches that are in the province of Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits that are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful and trustworthy witness, firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us, who has once for all freed us or washed us from our sins by his own blood and formed us into a kingdom priests to be subjects, his subjects, as priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and power and the majesty and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, citing Daniel 7. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, realizing their sin and guilt and anticipating the coming wrath. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, says the Lord God, who is existing forever, who was continually existing in the past, who is to come, the Almighty, the Omnipotent, the Ruler of all. I, John, your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patient endurance which are in Jesus, was on the isle called Patmos, exiled there because of my preaching of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit that is in special communication with the Holy Spirit and empowered to receive and record the revelation of Jesus Christ on the Lord's Day. By the way, that's Sunday. And I heard behind me a loud voice, like the sound of a trumpet, saying, Write on a scroll what you see in this revelation and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and after turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands I saw someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe reaching to his feet, and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were flashing like a flame of fire, piercing into my being. His feet were like burnished bronze, that is white hot bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was powerful, like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword of judgment, and his face, reflecting his majesty and the Shekinah glory, was like the sun shining in all its power at midday. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, and he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. 
I am the first and the last, absolute deity, the Son of God, and the ever-living one, living in and beyond all space and time. I died, but see, I am alive forevermore. And I have, or I hold, in my possession the keys that is the absolute control and victory over death and Hades that is the realm of the dead. So write the things which you have seen in a vision, and the things which are now happening, and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels, that is, the divine messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And to the messenger of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of the one who holds firmly the seven stars, which are the angels or messengers of the seven churches, in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, that is, the seven churches. The Quest of the Eyes of Flame By way of a brief introductory word, let us focus your attention upon what we feel to be the Lord's concern with his people at this time. In the second and third chapters of the book of the Revelation, we have the Lord's survey of the seven churches. As those eyes that are a flame of fire peer into the inner spiritual state and lay bare the condition, analyze, dissect, separate, place on the two sides of debit and credit, and form and pass their final verdict, we see one thing to be the issue with regard to them all. There may be particular differences in them. The aspects may vary. The elements may be very different. Yet when all has been surveyed and gathered together, it is to establish but one fact, namely the presence or absence of that which, from the Lord's standpoint, constitutes justification in the continuance of the Lord's full committal to anything which claims to represent Him. In that case, these seven churches. The issue for every one of these churches was whether, under the Lord's permission, they could remain as true witnesses, and whether they could continue as really representing Him. The Lord had them before Him, shall we say, had them in His hand, and was determining whether He could keep them or whether He would have to put them away, whether He would have to remove the lampstand out of its place, Revelation 2.5, or whether it could abide with His full approval so that the question was clearly one of continuing in relation to the Lord's intended purpose or losing its position. We have seen bodies cross the sky at night, coming from afar, gaining in brilliance, it seemed, and as they came near, flashing on their way, and then disappearing altogether from view in the darkness of the night. Here are stars, brought in by the eternal counsels of God, flashing in with the glory of His grace, some of them to cease to fill those counsels. The question concerning every instrumentality raised up by God in relation to His purpose is, how far can He go on with it? It is evident that there are things which do not justify Him in wholly supporting some instrumentalities which He originally raised up and used. These letters make those things clear. So just to pause, stars are first mentioned in Genesis 1 verse 14, and the stars shall be for signs and seasons. They are to communicate, they signify something. That which represents a messenger of the churches, they are to signify what God declares as a messenger. And we see that word melek and messenger used in Malachi for the priest, as well as for John the Baptist and for Jesus Christ. A messenger should embody that which represents the heart and mind of Jesus Christ. Well, in the first place, the fact that God originally raised up an instrumentality, that it came from him and was his work initially, does not justify him in keeping it indefinitely. That is made quite clear. We should take serious account of the fact that because God raised up a thing, it does not mean that he must of necessity keep that thing right through unconditionally. That is, no matter what its state or character may be eventually or in the course of time. Further, the fact that an instrument has had a wonderful history of devotion to him and has at some time been a very real and full expression of his grace and power does not resolve itself into a claim upon him, and he does not regard himself as under any obligation to preserve it indefinitely. But we have to press the point still further, because at any given time many commendable things are to be seen in an instrumentality which the Lord himself may praise, and there may be not a few such things nevertheless this record shows that even they do not justify god in preserving it in its former place even the presence of such comparatively good things does not mean that he may never consider putting them out of their original place or that he is bound to refrain from doing so 
There are many things which continue to exist and serve a purpose, but have lost their place in their original value to the Lord. That is a very thorough sifting of everything. It might be thought that if God raised up a thing, if it came in the first place from his own hand, if God had used it and blessed it, if it had shown the features and characteristics of his grace and his love, if that instrumentality still had in it many commendable things which God, looking with his eyes as a flame, could approve of, surely that is enough to argue for its continuance in the fullness of his blessing? You understand that we are speaking about instrumentalities. We are not speaking about souls. We are not dealing with the question of salvation, but with that of vocation. What then justifies the Lord in preserving and going on with any such instrumentality? We must look to see what motivated him when he brought it into being, what was in his mind and in his heart. We shall find all we need to know from the very description of the instrumentality itself. In the passage to which we have referred to, it is called a lampstand, seven golden lampstands. Our knowledge of the word gives us much light upon what that means, and the Old Testament in particular comes at once to our help, for whether it be the candlestick in the tabernacle, or the candlestick all of gold shown to Zechariah in Zechariah 4.2. We know that it is in both cases there was represented the living expression of the Holy Spirit's energies. Take the candlestick all of gold. We remember the pattern of it, with its seven bowls and seven golden pipes, and the oil being emptied out from the living olive trees through the pipes into the bowls to provide the resource for the light. It is a very complete, very comprehensive illustration, and it is something that is living. At one end, there is a living fountain or spring. The prophet does not say that there were cisterns, tanks, some man-made receptacle of oil, but living trees, and oil being poured out continually, ever fresh, warm from the arteries of that living organism, as it were, into the candlestick burning with its steady, undying light, a light which does not vary, which does not go out, which is maintained at full strength continually. Just a note about that passage in Zechariah 4. You'll read on in there, it says, and the golden oil was poured out. But it doesn't say oil. Oil is in italics. Gold was poured out. Buy from me gold refined in fire. That's the divine nature. That is what's communicated from Jesus Christ to the Holy Spirit as our high priest. That is what the Holy Spirit empowers, and that is what the Holy Spirit manifests, the gold of that divine nature. Secondly, the candlestick, if you read in, I believe it's in Exodus 25, that the candlestick was, before it was shaped, it was made of one piece of gold. You take one piece of gold, and they hammered it into a candlestick. So it was one unified piece designed to manifest the divine nature. The undying flame. It is the testimony of an unfailing, undying, all-sufficient life. The testimony of a life which is not abstract, not something stored up, but something which is coming all the time from an inexhaustible stream, a mighty, glorious life. As the light burns, it is a constant declaration of victory, and that a victory over death, which would seek to smother the flame. It burns in the midst of surrounding death, a continuous declaration that death has no power to quench it. To come back to the book of Revelation, what is it, and what is it that alone justifies God in maintaining any instrumentality in full relation to himself and his purpose? It is not that the instrumentality has many good things. It is not that it had its origin with God. It is not that it has a great history, a great past, a good tradition. It is not that it has a name, a reputation, a name of its more glorious days. It is that there is today the same undying flame of divine life in it, a testimony against the power of death all around. That is God's justification. Well, we have a witness right here in our midst that death should have overtaken some of us more than once, even this last year. And so there's the evidence that Jesus Christ is doing something to maintain that life. When we come to analyze the state of these churches, we find that in five of them, at least, there is a variety of elements, each of which is an expression of something that is a contradiction to the Holy Spirit, a contradiction to the Spirit of life. When such a thing is found amongst the Lord's people, within the vessel, the instrument, it constitutes an element of death and provides Satan with his foothold, that is, stronghold, and all unconsciously, for the most part, among those people, the testimony is contradicted. The point is this, 
Satan will resort to anything. His methods and his means are numerous to get some foothold for death in a divinely constituted instrumentality so that the thing becomes a contradiction right at its very center. It has a name that is a reputation. It has good works. It has many things which even the Lord himself cannot judge because they are good. But the vital thing by which alone the Lord can be justified in maintaining that instrumentality in its former position has been countered. It is not a question of what there once was of good and whether it still flourishes today, but rather has the Lord that central, basic, essential, indispensable thing for which he has ever raised up his instrumentalities, whether individuals or companies, and brought them into relationship with himself. That for which he apprehended them, that which was intended to be their specific vocation. It is not a matter of its bulk, size, or earthly quantity, but its intrinsic quality. As Revelation 3.18, Jesus says, Buy for me gold refined in fire. That gold is the intrinsic quality of the divine nature of the perfected humanity of Jesus Christ, which is that which we are to become perfected, Hebrews 6.1. Let us look again at the particular case in point, Revelation 2.1, and of course its sequel. The Lord is saying, from whence thou hast fallen, the first works, think again, reconsider and change back, repent. To whom does he so address himself? To Ephesus. Ephesus, only 30 years before, had Ephesus received that deposit of revelation above which there is nothing to excel in the New Testament that wonderful disclosure of the eternal counsels and calling of God, which came to bear the name Ephesians. Oh, the tragedy of Ephesus. Time was when it could be said that, through her, all Asia was affected. Her intrinsic value registered over that wide area. Read that in Acts 20. What did the Lord mean by removing her lampstand out of its place? Not necessarily that by one stroke, what was there would be wiped out or brought it out not a geographical removal or a literal extinction. Ephesus and its church went on for many years, but its essentially spiritual position in the vocation wherewith it was called, that's Ephesians 4.1, was lost. It became something else. It may have grown numerically. It might have been accepted in Ephesus. Its good works may have remained and been many. But its spiritual measure, intrinsic virtue, and resources for the church beyond its locality were lost. Its place spiritually could be removed without its temporal and material location being touched. Is this not the sad story of so many things which had a beginning and went on in spiritual power and spontaneous effectiveness for some years, but eventually lost their spiritual place and position in the whole counsel of God? Remember, at Ephesus, Acts 20, he did not withhold declaring the whole counsel of God to them. That's in Acts 20. In many cases, both of individual and personal and collective ministries, we have to say, they have lost out. They do not correspond to their beginning. Many places which once were centers of far-reaching influence, while still existing, only do so on an earlier tradition. Many ministries under which we felt the divine impact have, with the extra tragic factor of insensibility to the fact, lost that divine unction. Is it expansion without commensurate spiritual resource? Is it popularity and acceptance which has robbed it of the sense of crisis and urgency? Has the vision faded because of success or adversity? Have elements of contradiction found a loophole somewhere and worked like secret leaven to corrupt? Whatever it might be, there it is. And such a thing is on record in the Word of God as a warning for all time that this is the peril which besets anything which God raised up as a lamp of true testimony. Some of us inwardly weep as, in our own lifetime, we have seen this tragedy in servants of God, in movements and instrumentalities which have lost out. Spiritual pride is a major and certain cause of such disaster. When the institution, mission, center, or anything becomes the object of talk and gratification, and it is not the Lord in growing fullness, then the days of the Lord's full committal to it are numbered. We have all been apprehended of Jesus Christ, and there has been a purpose behind that apprehending. That's Philippians 3, 7 through 17. We have not been apprehended just to be saved. Our salvation is but basic or foundational and introductory to something very much more. The Lord gathers his own together to form them into a corporate vessel of divine purpose. 
He raises up such instrumentalities from time to time, but whether it be individuals or whether it be companies, one constant danger is that the essential thing in the divine thought in raising it up in apprehending that vessel should somehow be lost while many other things may continue. The Lord's Standard of Judgment One inclusive thing arises from this survey of the churches. It is that the Lord deals with every life or vessel in the light of his specific purpose for it and not of its general usefulness. These chapters would never have been written if the Lord were simply taking this view. Well, this vessel is not wholly bad. There is much yet of value here. It has not altogether gone away from me. Therefore, I must look after it and support it, preserve it, and commit myself wholly to it. But the Lord is not doing that. We may be thankful to the Lord for anything that there is in this world which is good and is of himself. And as we ourselves go into it, we are grateful that the Lord should have any witness in the world like this. But oh, so far as his own people are concerned, so far as the church is concerned, that never satisfies him. Of that, we may be quite sure. The only churches he really doesn't censor is Smyrna, the suffering martyr church, and Philadelphia. He encourages. The others, he begins with Ephesus with commendation, and he concludes with condemnation. With Smyrna, he begins with encouragement, commendation, and there's no condemnation. And then with Pergamum, he begins with commendation, concludes with condemnation. And then we move to Thyatira, he begins with commendation, he concludes with condemnation. That's the first four. Then beginning with Sardis, he begins with condemnation. And then he concludes with commendation. And then with Philadelphia, it's all commendation, no condemnation. And Laodicea, the only church where sin is not even addressed. It's all condemnation and no commendation. It's the only church. Laodicea. That speaks volumes. So of that we may be quite sure. And by the way, just as a reminder, the revelation of Jesus Christ in Revelation 1 as a king priest after the order of Melchizedek, we see him as son of man presented in Revelation 1. And when you compare Revelation chapter 1 with the revelation of the son of man in Daniel 7, in Daniel 7, the son of man is presented before the ancient of days who is God the Father. God the Father is described in Daniel 7, hair white as wool, all the attributes of God the Father that are mentioned in Daniel 7 are now embodied and manifested in Jesus Christ as the glorified Son of Man of Revelation 1. Now that's just huge. That's massive revelation. That's a shift in a progress in divine revelation. And then when you come to Revelation 2 and 3, with each beginning address to the seven churches, an aspect of the resurrected and glorified Jesus Christ is brought to bear upon those local assemblies so he is brought in as the standard of measure for each church. In other words, everything is being judged in Revelation 2 and 3 according to Christ. Everything is being measured by him. If you look at that measure principle in Amos chapter 7, there are two warning judgments, but then the appeal is made and God withholds the judgment and then finally There's a man with a plumb line that's brought in the midst. And once the plumb line is there, judgment proceeds from God to his people. Jesus is that plumb line in the midst of the churches in Revelation 1. Why are we saying this? Because so many people say, well, you know you are trying to get something so perfect. Why not be satisfied with what is commendable about the church today? Take it as it is, accept it, and be thankful that there are so many who belong to the Lord and bear his name in a world like this. I find that this record does not allow that. God knows that we are grateful that there are believers in this world, be they but poor ones. You cannot go abroad in a world like this and see its state, its godlessness, its sinfulness, without being thankful to find even a very poor specimen of a believer who has some love in his heart for the Lord. You are thankful for the smallest thing that speaks of him. Oh, but when you come to see God's purpose, when you see that what he has designed for his church is the occasion of his call, his choosing in Christ, you can never be satisfied with nominalism or with general goodness. When you come to a word like this, you find it taking you right on, if you like, to call it extreme, you may, right on to the end. 
it tells you quite plainly that whether there be a great past, a great history of divine blessing and usefulness, a great reputation for good works, and many good things are still obtaining, none of these things is an adequate justification for the Lord to commit himself wholly to that vessel, for he has some reservations. He must have questions unless the purpose for which that vessel was raised up is being fulfilled. None of the New Testament letters would have been written if the Lord was satisfied with the merely nominal. There has never been anything perfect, but the serious matter is that of our attitude to not having yet attained. This is what Paul says in Philippians 3, 7-17. Paul said, I am not yet perfect, but, and very much hung upon that but, one thing I do, I press for the prize. I seek to lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ laid hold of me. These churches in Revelation had accepted their imperfect condition. The nominal is ultimately rejected. Like with Sardis, you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. That's nominalism. For what was the church raised up? I do not believe that the Lord originally thought of having a general church and then a special one within it, a general mass of believers and then a company called overcomers in the midst. That has never been the design of God. It is what we might call an emergency state of things and is essential because of general failure. It seems to me that the very word overcomers presupposes that there is a failure somewhere. Overcomers is a New Testament designation for the remnant as found in the Old Testament. So the Lord's purpose for all his church as a vessel, which nevertheless may only be realized in a few, is that it should maintain the testimony of a life which has conquered death and will conquer death right to the end. Culminating in rapture is a life question. Thus Paul says, those who are characterized as the living ones, namely the surviving remnant, shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and so we shall ever be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 and 18. The Lord Jesus is constituted the great witness upon the ground of the power of God which was exercised in him when he raised him from the dead. Ephesians 1.19 and following. Remember that the testimony of Jesus is always related to his being raised from the dead. That is, that he lives by a power which has conquered death. He is the life on that ground, on that basis, in that sense. And those whom the New Testament approves as witnesses to Jesus are not those who talk the truth about him, but are witnesses of his resurrection. They are setting forth the evidence of his resurrection. That, of course, in a spiritual way, witnesses to Christ as risen. Not verbally, but it's who they are. The New Testament's testimony of Jesus is that God raised him from the dead and that he is alive forevermore. That is the essence of the testimony. Thus the whole question resolves itself into one testimony in life, a testimony of life. It is not a testimony of doctrine in the first place, but a testimony of life. Is the flame burning as at the beginning, witnessing that Jesus lives and is triumphant even over the dark, deadly background of this world? That is the question for the Lord's people, the question for your life and mine, and for every collective instrumentality. As we proceed, we shall see a great deal of what that means. For the moment, we simply focus our thoughts upon the issue. I have no doubt in my heart as to what the issue of our time is. I trust that in this matter we may rightly claim to be of the tribe of Issachar, so to speak, to know what the time is saying and what Israel ought to do. as First Chronicles 12, verse 32. Sons of Iskar who were knowers of the times and they told Israel what to do. I have not the slightest shadow of a doubt, but that the issue of our day, of this hour in the church's history is, more than ever, the issue of life and death in a spiritual sense. Are you not more and more experiencing that awful sapping of your very vitality, that draining of your life, that exhausting of your energy, perhaps especially in relation to prayer? Is it not true that it often requires supreme effort to pray and to get through when you have started to pray? You need energizing from a source other than that of your own natural energies in this matter, and that increasingly so. There is a strange, deep, terrible sapping of vitality Life forces, mental and physical vitality as well as spiritual. Spiritual people at least know something of that. And lying at the back of it is the final conflict of this age. It is the spiritual issue of life and death.
The Lord would say to us something about that at this time. And we have to direct our eyes in the way of the Lord's thought to the great issue which is at stake for his people. I trust that we shall know that he is not only making us aware of it, and not only warning us about the perils of it, but that he comes mightily to our aid and shows us what is on our side in the battle. And so the next chapter is what we'll pick up the next time, the controversy of Zion.